So you've got this one-dimensional ring of current orbiting the x-axis. The magnitude of the current is i. The ring has radius big R. Every infinitesimal sliver dl of the ring is a distance r from point p along the x-axis and has unit vector r hat pointing from it to p. You want to find the magnetic field at point p due to the ring of current. As a first step, consider the infinitesimal magnetic field produced by each infinitesimal sliver of the ring dl. First, consider its direction. Since the direction of the flow is tangent to the ring at each sliver dl, dl can be imagined as a vector pointing this way. Then, drawing a circle around the vector centered at the sliver dl and with a radius r such that it touches point p. Considering vectors tangent to the circle that follow the right-hand rule, it becomes clear that the infinitesimal magnetic field db caused by dl can be represented by this vector. As other dl's and their respective db's are considered, a cone of vectors is created. When all of these vectors are added together, their radial components cancel, leaving only the final vector bx, which conveniently points along the x-axis. Now that direction has been settled, we look to find its magnitude. The magnitude of db can be found using the law of Biot and Savart, but to find bx, we must relate db to every infinitesimal contribution to bx dbx. Fortunately, db and dx are related through a right triangle. Thus, they can be related via a trigonometric function, specifically sine or cosine since the former is the hypotenuse while the latter is a leg. Arbitrarily choose to consider this angle, which we will call phi. Note that phi is also present here. Thus, we can write that sine phi equals dbx over db, and that sine phi also equals big R over little r. Combining these two equations gives us dbx over db equals big R over little r, or dbx equals big R over little r times db. Note that it is a good idea to substitute out the trigonometric function because leaving phi just introduces another variable, further complicating the final equation. So great, now we have dbx in terms of db. This means that we can now substitute in the bs law for db. Let's work on simplifying this equation. To begin, combine the three fractions. Although it may not be initially clear, this diagram reveals that dl and r vectors are perpendicular. Viewed from above, the diagram makes this fact much more obvious. Owing to this, it is possible to substitute the cross product for the magnitude of the dl vector times the magnitude of r hat. Since the magnitude of the dl vector is just dl and the magnitude of r hat is 1, the equation further simplifies. Also move the dl to the end of the equation, as is proper with any variable of integration. At this point, there is no more obvious algebraic simplification, so let's consider integrating. Note that every term, save the two variables of integration, is a constant. Thus, when we integrate, we can immediately move them out in front of the integral. Consider the bounds on which dl should be integrated. Starting at any point on the ring, moving along it, and ending back at the original point will result in covering the circumference once. Since c equals 2 pi r, integrate dl from 0 to 2 pi r, big R by the way. As to the left side of the equation, note that since we are summing every infinitesimal contribution to bx, the integral of dbx will simply be bx, which is perfect since that's what we initially sought to find. Evaluating the integral and simplifying gives us a final equation for the magnetic field at point p given all the other initial parameters. Note that the equation could be expressed in terms of the distance from the center of the ring to change to char ah, of charge to point P, but because of the simplicity of this equation and the simple Pythagorean transition to the other, I have chosen to leave it this way. Thanks for watching. I hope you have found this video enjoyable and informative.